the woman asked without looking up. She was trying to tack buttons through silk rulu loops on a nightdress. Her hair was blonde and messy with volume at the crown. She had a thick black ribbon tied around her head. Her part was deep over her left eye, the eye that almost looked up when I walked in. There was a big gap in her two front teeth that could be seen when she smiled, which she did when I couldn't answer her. I was embarrassed to be there, like I was doing something wrong. Now let's do one more. This is a little bit, should I do the little bit from the essay or Robert's List, Chris? What do you think? Well, I love Robert's List. Okay, I'm gonna read Robert's List. Well, or why not both? There's time for both. Okay, I'll start with Robert's List, which is kind of like a funny poem. Basically, the premise was, you know, this idea when you um, have someone in your life who you want to tell things to, but you know you can't all the time, so you would write down them to remember, or like now maybe you'd send a note on your phone or, um, you know, scribble it down so you could tell them the next time you see them or talk to them. And this is a list that he made. Um, part of it while she was alive and part of it post-mortem of things she would want to, he would want to tell Olympia that he can no longer tell her. Crimson, red to red, puns, abstraction, all not definitive, versus pictorial alphabets, textus to life, erotic, sexual, discursive, objective is to defer end result, obtain ideas of work without intention or inquiry. What is coded communication? No woman touches your toe. It makes me sad and happy at the same time. To talk to everyone is to talk to no one. Mall grab, screen grab, techno paganism, Zozo, like the devil, but also that Japanese site that made that guy rich. Don't work for my house, my house works for me. Inner tubes, punk and academia, play on digits, edit and aware of the digit, edit and aware of the edit, American postmodernist, cobra baby and elephant, with the number two rooms to go. Cult of personality, make things people don't need. Renegotiating romanticism, outside the system, back in it. What happened to Karen Mulder? Michael Jordan, number 23. Boston Latin, first public school. Sense of an ending, reputation. It's not about cool things, it's about cool moves. Notes in camp, tree. Feminist avant-garde collected by misogynist. Inversion of taste, lack of responsibility, integrity of work. Female, glamorous, cipher, surface, powerful female bonds. You misunderstand me. Not pick up calls. Negative biography. A list of what you say no to. Don't access that side, live in the glamour. Short story. Decisive and move on, leave and never come back. Never go back. Another lost. Post agenda, origin story. Visual and verbal wit. A little bit more. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you. That was a great reading. Thank you. Um, so yeah, can we talk about some of the things that, that come up in your writing and in this book? I wanted, I wanted to start with coincidence, which is, you know, all through the book. I mean, right up until the design of the book, um, you found that amazing Guibert photograph that almost exactly described a phantom photograph that was taken in one scene of the book I that mean, had been lost. And you, you weren't aware of this photograph, were you? No, this was the craziest thing that happened. I mean, I was, and when I tell people this, they don't believe me, but I had no idea that this photograph existed. And I was, um, looking up is images of Isabella Gianni because I love her and I wanted to find, you know, movie stills and things. And then I came across this photograph and she had the ribbon in her hair, first of all, which caught my attention because that's in the book. But even the strangest thing was then I went to research the photograph and it was taken at the Jardin de Plant, which I had already written into the book as the location where the photograph was taken. It totally blew my mind. And obviously perhaps there's, you know, speaks to that sort of like psychic quality of, I don't know, I mean, I must have known it was there. It was, it's too much to how it's similar it is. A magical process, the writing of the book results in the discovery of this photograph, which was always there from the beginning, but not seen. Completely, and even the fact, even the tiger, I mean, I just, I couldn't have, you know, I couldn't have even imagined that. It reminds me of the scene from Cat People, the movie as well, that I'd always loved to photograph of, but I'd never seen this photograph before. Yeah. 
So I wanted to ask you, you know, some stuff about um, some stuff about what holds the story together. Like, I was thinking about your first book this morning, the memoir that you wrote in 2012, where you frame the autobiography of your early teens by cataloging certain strange, strange objects that were important to you then, a skeleton key and a whale's tooth and a cardigan sweater. The objects were like the anchoring of the book and of your consciousness then as too. Um, in the super in the super rationals, coincidence is like the invisible through line for all the different little shards of story that come up in the book. And so I'm wondering, how did you arrive at these framing strategies? Does the framing strategy come first, or does the material come first? Um, how does that work? At what point did you make that choice? Well, it's funny. The memoir I find, you know, you see me look down. I find a bit embarrassing because obviously it's a, mem a memoir, of child. It's a childhood memoir, which kind of doesn't make any sense to begin with. But um, what happened there mostly, and it does make sense if I look at it in perspective of the new book, is that I was um, I was sort of obsessed with control as a kid. I think because my parents sort of took away any kind of semblance of control, the way that they uh, moved me around as a kid, the way they structured our lives, the way they um, made choices, the way we were always alone. And I felt very out of control. And so for me, it took finding something sort of tangible or, you know, that was actually in my path as a, you know, talisman or a way of structuring the story, which, does come around again if you think of like the nouveau roman and the idea that objects can be plot so like if you look at it in that sense it makes sense on a more interesting level but when you know in the sense of the first book it's presented in a much more simplistic manner um and i think that that is actually the exact opposite of the idea of coincidence leading something forward because that's something yes, that's completely because coincidence is so intangible exactly and I think I always wanted to believe in the coincidence and I do and just like the photograph and that sort of I mean that's the only hopeful thing really that there is there are coincidences there are run-ins there are you know psychic things you don't know about um right away and that you can change or you know the past corrects itself but I think in the first book it was important to sort of almost ground myself and so that was a way of sort of you know, locking down these scenes, finding these things, getting control of an otherwise out of control sort of mentality. Right. Um, and I guess that also speaks to then me trying to sort of look for some kind of restraint, which is like, like um, a new Lippian or uh, something like that, which is actually, again, the opposite of coincidence. The idea that you can have a mathematical formula in writing directly contradicts you know, the idea of this intuitive sort of flowing process. Yeah, you've mentioned Uli Pro before as an influence on you as a writer. I just felt like when I originally started this book, I wanted it to be sort of like a palindrome in the plot that you, you could fold it over and it would repeat itself, which in the end, I guess it kind of accomplished, but originally I was much more constrained by it. I, at one point I was trying to make the last word in every chapter become the first word in the next. Like, oh, the, like a sestina, like a yeah, sestina. Yeah, or That's something, beautiful. all kinds of different things like that. And I wanted that to sort of uh, become representative, but it became, you know, I had all these books too on like word games and anagrams and palindromes. And I was spending my time like rearranging letters and secret messages and all of these things. and. In the end, that kind of fell away, but I mean, that was something that I found really interesting at the beginning. Yeah, maybe those games are also kind of triggers into another state of consciousness. A hundred percent. You know, they're kind of a mobilizing force, a way of kind of gathering your energies and kind of lifting it out of the everyday onto another plane. And that was the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, Mathilde describes the uncanny as unexpected events that result in unexpected connections between people and make us feel less alone. And it's coincidence that drives the various stories across the book. 
So do you think like William Burroughs and Brian Geisen wrote in The Third Mind, that there's an invisible zone of coincidence that exists always, that we can enter at any time with the right mental discipline? And do you see coincidence as a spiritual practice? I mean, I definitely do. Um, in more ways than one, I mean, I was raised by parents, one parent who, you know, was it admittedly didn't believe or not, or, or not believe in God. And, you know, rituals were important, all these different kinds of things sort of, again, trying to make some kind of control when I had no rules, no set of control, no, you know, nothing to sort of hold me down. And um, I think that for me, the most hopeful thing in an otherwise very, very depressing existence is coincidence, because it's this belief that something will draw, you know, will, will present itself to you that will change the course of whatever you felt or that was intended or there's something magical about that. And um, maybe I'm not answering your question very well, but um, I definitely believe in writing too as a way, at least for me, I'm not like a very good formal writer. Um, I'm not a very, like I'm not trying to be, it's like an exorcism um, sort of, you know, everything comes out and then is figured out along the way. Does that make sense? In yeah, context? no, that's beautiful. I mean, coincidence kind of as a way out of ourselves, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the only the sort of, you know, yeah, incessant like, repetition of like banal arguments about our problems. And then this other unexpected thing happens that can't be explained in any logical way. And it's the only thing really that would keep you going, you know, is the fact that that could happen. And so what is that thing? And how do we find that thing? Will it find us? And I mean, I think things like that happen all the time. I yeah, hope. there's this great romance of chance. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk also about the art world aspects of the book. Um, Mathilde worked in an auction house alongside the girls, you know, your Greek chorus of unbearable, expensively educated gossips who seem to be sitting there temporarily in between finishing college and getting married. Um, but Mathilde's a true believer in art. And one of the through lines that runs across the novel is a series of excerpts from Mathilde's art history thesis, right? She's always quoting her art history thesis. Um, and in it, she writes about Carly Schneeman, Mike Kelly, Donald Judd, Cy Twombly. She writes about the way the work of art is actually a vessel waiting to be filled by whatever the audience projects onto it. And I really love that idea. That feels so, so true. Um, it's almost as if the thesis haunts her, reminding her of what drew her to the art world in the first place. And sometimes the excerpts feel like a bitter critique of the distance between artistic ideals and the daily practice of art business. So can you talk about those things? First, the idea of a vessel that's filled by what we project onto the thing. And then second, you know, what you were doing here with the use of the thesis in the book. Yeah, I mean, um, and one other thing quickly about what you mentioned that I think was super important and you have spot on is this idea that they're in this job sort of as a placeholder behind, between, you know, this ridiculous education that clearly has gotten them to sitting in a job looking up links of shopping online or whatever, and then, you know, finding, finding a husband as like, you know, they're in there so that they can go there and then that's the next step and then the hell with the job kind of a situation. And it's just this like very bizarre timeline or sort of like system that seemed something that was kind of like, you know, it does exist. And um, anyway, that seems like something interesting to comment on. But, and that leads directly to the idea of the importance of the art. And yeah, I mean, she's, she believes in it, but she's kind of like, surrounded by people who have taught her you need to survive and in order to survive whatever that means nowadays is to almost sort of give that up like her mom tells her you can't be a dancer don't be a dancer you know someone else tells her you can't be an artist how are you going to make a living someone else you know all these things around her are telling her like you know give up on that it's not practical like believe in the practical don't believe in the um the magic or whatever you want to see and um, I think the idea of the, um, you know, the, the projection and the, 
the artwork is also sort of, I mean, in a way I was playing with also the book itself, like even all these reviews, like people are seeing whatever they want to see within the thing. And that's also a bit of psychoanalysis as well. Like whatever you, I mean, it's what we do in relationships as well. We project onto the thing, whatever we're intending to see, or we want to see, or we want to believe. And I think some of, um, and that's why, for example, visual art can be a little bit easier to do that with because you don't have the words actually written down in front of you. Um, and I think the book talks a little bit about that too. Um, am I not answering the question directly? No, or? but you're, you're answering a more interesting question <laughs> that I didn't even bother ask, asking. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, and I think that those artists were important touchstones to her for many different reasons. Um, I think Sai Twombly in particular, because a lot, a lot of the, um, the Greek words that he would write on canvases are what I was thinking of at the time, and um, those allusions, and then, you know, um, back to sort of that sort of ecstatic process. And then I was also thinking a lot of, um, in terms of Mike Kelly, you know, the childhood, the idea of like, you know, we all sort of come back to all these you know what happened to us what we're trying to find and you know he has these harems as well that are collections of things much like the first book which he mentioned were an ability to like say you know catalog collect put in line like figure out where your things go you know it which is what museums do as well um and yeah yeah so yeah you're talking here like about how art gets historicized, right? What you just said is that people are feel so threatened when they're confronted by an art object because it has no words and they don't know what to think or say. And of course, that's where we come in when we write art criticism and art writing. And I'm just curious, Stephanie, we've never talked about this before, but your relation to visual art, because you know, in your other work, you do write about visual art quite a lot, right? I mean, did you always like like art? Did you always get it? What was? <laughs> oh my God, that feels so ridiculous to say. Um, well, I guess I, I mean I was kind of forced into it in a way because when I was young, in when my family moved um, overseas, we didn't. What we would do every weekend was you know, my mom and dad would just like drop us off at a museum or be like, "Stay here. This is what you're doing." You know, we didn't have friends. We didn't have. So it was like this constant sort of, and I hated it. I didn't, I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but I guess maybe through osmosis or sort of like, again, that sort of unconscious, whatever, it became, you know, sort of what was always around sort of, you know, and um, something that I thought about. I was completely discouraged from having anything to do with it myself, as well as, you know, practicing writing as a craft. So like that wasn't an option. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can't claim like, oh, I've always wanted, you know, to be, to like be involved in it. But yeah, it's, you know, it was always a part of my life in some way. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I just, it feels silly to like say it in any other um, manner, but it was always important to my parents as something, but not something that could be practiced like, or could be pursued by me. So if you have a free day in a strange city, you're someone who would actually voluntarily go to an art museum? Uh, I mean, a hundred percent. Like my biggest, <laughs> and my biggest, you know, there's that book, um, that, that book that's popular with American kids called about the kids who sleep at the Met. I mean, that was like my dream when I was little. I was like, I want to be in a museum at nighttime. I had like this bizarre fascination with, um, being locked in a museum at night which is like really twisted actually and weird for a kid but yeah that was like my goal was to like run away and hide and no one would find me and then oh, i would get locked in there that sounds wonderful um okay let me go back to some of the questions i thought of earlier um yeah this this part is called critique um Sam Reviewers have suggested that the super rationals is implicitly an epitaph for the art world defined by money and privilege, a witty commentary on an elite that's already drawn its last breath. But I don't see things changing in the art world that way anytime soon. 
To me, the fascination of the novel is the way it probes the turmoil under the surfaces of these very polished lives. Mathilde is a classic light jeune fille heroine, but the hole that's left in her heart by her mother's death is incredibly real. Can you talk about your relation to the art world in the book? And how did you balance dark and light? It's as if Violet Leduc meets early Colette. Was that a I conscious love, attempt? I love that. I love Violet Leduc. I was reading. <laughs> um, one of the rooms in the hotel, I think, is called Violet Leduc in the book, or at least in the actual hotel that it was based on, is called the Leduc room. Um, and there are the two girls who act a bit like Gretchen and Mathilde in that book as well. Um, you know, the one of the, uh, Iris, is it? The one where the two girls are having their first sexual experience. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I think it, this plays back to what you were saying before about um, sort of uh, the, um, you know, the relationship. It was, this, this setting wasn't gratuitous, but it was to probe the questions like the ones that you asked. Like, it wasn't like, oh, let's set it in this glamorous place where all these things are happening because it's interesting and fun. It was like, let's set it though so that you see the sort of inconsistency or sort of um you know the underbelly of that of like what what is actually being passed among these people and what that means and how it's sort of antithetical to what the passing around so to speak or like you know that sort of to explore if you can really you know what it means to to really you know be working in this way um, and, you know, for her, it was just like, you know, she was just this, this sort of doll that had these roles that she had to play, that she had to show up for that involved nothing of her own, you know, spirit or taste or interests or, you know, what moved her, like nobody cared, nobody wanted to know. And, um, and I, I purposefully also did, I think what you're saying where, it could be seen as this very light story, like a very, you can read it on a very basic level, which a lot of people have told me they've read it twice in this way, which kind of makes, which makes me very happy. Um, you know, you can sort of zoom through it as this like mystery. You want to find out what happens. Everyone's kind of an asshole. Like everyone's really funny. You hate them all. And then you can read it again and, and stop for a moment and sort of see the underlying, uh, you know, current of what's going on or what's being challenged by virtue of simply the story itself. I love that idea that there can be two completely separate parallel readings of the book and both are true. Well, that was kind of my thought. My original thought was I want to write something that will appeal to a ton of people and can be read on one level. And then if you so choose, you can see it was again, it goes back to that idea of the, the games, the mysteries, the words being mixed up inside. If you want to look for the puzzles, you can. If you'd prefer to just read the book and pass it along to someone else, then you can do that too. What made you come up with the title, The Super Rationals? How did you get there? Um, I loved, I love the idea of game theory um, in this sense of also sort of, you know, everyone's trying to play chess with other people and sort of to know what one person's going to do um, versus what another person's going to do, particularly in like romantic situations that then impact business or vice versa. And I, um, and I was really into reading about um, game theory and this idea of, you know, the prisoner's dilemma. Like what, you know, what does it change what you want knowing what someone else is going to do? Can we ever know what someone else is going to do? I mean, people often misread the title to think what I'm saying is that they're very rational like the idea of being very rational in your thinking, which actually wasn't the intention originally. But I mean, that's funny in its own way, because like, when do humans ever behave rationally? And the book is so much about emotions, which are the opposite of, you know, rational thoughts or like logical deductions. And I liked this idea of also, are women the logical ones? Are they the hysterical ones? You know, there's always that undercurrent through literature as well. But no, maybe Mathilde is the rational one. Yeah. That brings me to the end of my list of questions. Can I ask you some questions? Yeah, yeah, okay. we talked about this. And yes, I think this is like probably a little bit of space for it, but then we definitely want time for other people to talk too. Okay, well, I want to know what you're working on now. And I think everyone would love to hear that too. I'm super interested in it. Okay. <laughs> well, I've, ju I've just started, I'm not writing this book yet, but I've been researching it all summer. I was, I 
the last 10 years or so, I've been spending time in northern Minnesota in the summer, but also at other times of the year. My partner has lived up there part time and was working in social services up there for a couple of years. And while I was up there in January 2019, there was this very dramatic um, murder that took place um, among three teenagers killing an acquaintance. They were all on methamphetamine. Um, they were all up for like two days before the murder actually took place. And, you know, in these little isolate towns, these kind of acts of violence are, well, actually increasingly frequent, but still very, very shocking. And, you know, we have a cabin up there in the woods and it's like, oh, look at the loons, there are the snow geese, the trumpet swans. It's a beautiful nature retreat. And you have to go to the town to go to the supermarket, but otherwise you don't have much to do with it. And I realized that the world of what goes on in these kind of beat to shit northern Midwestern towns is completely different. And I started to become curious about it and about the people that were passing through. Um, actually, Philip, my partner, was working in a, a juvenile detention center. And, you know, what the story was of the life that passes through there and this army of kids that have grown up only in foster care because their parents and grandparents are all addicted. Um, so I was up there for three months continuously doing research about these particular kids, their backgrounds, their families, their stories, and also, you know, the case and the larger community. And I'm about to start working on that as a book now. Wow. Wow. And it's going to be nonfiction. No, no, actually, I think it's going to be more like fiction. fiction. Um, I think it's maybe going to be kind of a continuation of um, Summer of Hate. Amazing. Um, with the characters, Kat Dunlop and Paul Garcia. Oh, amazing. And but how I, I mean, I've always, for a long time, ever since, since living in the Adirondacks in the mid-80s with Silver, and then writing about that in my novel, Turper, I've always been interested in these kind of remote places in the U.S. of rural poverty. Wow. I mean, the difference is in the Southern Adirondacks, what drew us and I think a few other outsiders there was there was still an intact local culture. Cable television was still new at that time and people didn't all necessarily have it. And there was actually amazingly kind of an oral tradition of stories that went back to people's grandparents, great, great grandparents. I mean, I did a video called Traveling at Night about the Underground Railroad. And some of the stories of the Underground Railroad were told word of mouth. They hadn't even been written down. They were just passed down stories. The community was that isolate and that involved with each other, that incestuous. And so, of course, that's all completely blown away now and changed, and it's just media internet culture. So, yeah, this is like an ongoing interest. What happens outside our cultural bubbles in these other parts of the world? Can I ask you one more question in terms of that and the storytelling idea? Have you, when you speak to, let's say, the kids or, you know, the people where you're doing, do you, is there a, still an oral tradition? Are you hearing stories? Are you hearing sort of versions of the different versions of the same story? Is there anything? No, there's, there's no oral tradition at all. People have really? no memory. Wow. You know, the people that I'm speaking to kind of remember what happened last week. Wow, so how, are you, so how are you handling that? Are you looking at the digital footprint of these people? Or are you looking at... Yeah, I have a lot of digital stuff, but the police reports are actually a very good forum. The police reports read like their autobiographies because the police are involved all the time. The right. police always have to write up a formal report. So on the one hand, I can look at their social media. On the other hand, I can look at the police accounting of these same events. And do you find discrepancy? I mean, maybe I'm going too oh, yes, far. Oh, of but course, of course. <laughs> and, then, and then the third way is asking people themselves what they remember, which is usually not very much. They remember, so, like, at, like all of us, they remember feelings, but they right. don't remember facts. And for somebody who's had a very kind of chaotic and stressful life, that's even more true. The facts really just elude you. And I think you're talking about kind of in a way, getting on top of reality in your first book through your relation to these objects as an anchoring. I think like in all cases in life, this kind of 
mastery of the facts is the first way of like overcoming complete powerlessness. And I, I mean, it also makes me think of how when you have trauma, the first thing you do is sort of forget the facts or when there's yeah. been something, you know, that's been, yeah. that's, you know, or you, you remember the, you remember the feelings. Yeah. Or, or you're and it's very also hard yeah. to kind of get past the motivational speak that people speak in. If you ask them any personal question, they revote to kind of motivational slogan poster speak of what they think they're supposed to say about things. That's so interesting. Have you had two different people repeat the same thing back to you in that vein? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it takes a lot of being there and hanging around to kind of get beyond that. So Amazing. that's what I've been trying to do. Amazing. Um, is, there, um, is there anything that you want to talk about that you feel like you've been wanting to address in your writing um, or, you know, as an essay or anything that's brewing that you think would be interesting to sort of for us to, I don't know, is there anything I, right I just now? Wanted, I wanted to compare notes a little bit about our art writing activities. Okay, let's do it. And ask you how you feel about art writing at this moment. I've kind of, I've gone off it. I can't do it anymore. I'm not very good at it, so I mean, I, well, I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 I probably should go off of it, but... Um, I, would, I would disagree, but I mean, in the last year, it's every time I've been asked to write that kind of essay, um, I have to turn it down because I find that I can't, something like the words are choking in my throat. There's that giving yourself this authority that I find really hard to believe in right now. Um, so and what if I want that to do happen? something to support the work, I always, I, now I suggest just having a conversation. Artists, you know, an artist to artist conversation the way we are now. And I think anything that you think and feel about the work is going to come out in conversation. But to sort of write it down in any authoritative way at this moment feels really false to me. It's funny because that also doubles back to me to that idea of actually one of the questions you asked me that I didn't answer properly. I'm always so fascinated how, you know, because of all the critical art writing, you can get this interpretation of something that was completely not intended. I mean, I don't know if that matters. Intention, I'm not sure where intention falls in that either. But, um, and I think maybe this, you can speak to this and this goes back to that. It's like you're putting maybe even something onto, you know, a piece of work that was never intended or was meant to be much more of a, um, you know, you know, you're sort of intellectualizing something that perhaps wasn't intended for that purpose or, you know, you're giving up. And it's also like we create then the world surrounding that thing, which may not exist either. And I think, but I'm, what I want to ask you is, at what point did this happen? Can you pinpoint it to something in particular in your life or politically or... Was there, at, at what moment did that really start to coalesce for you that you'd prefer to do a conversation than actually a critique this of something? Is pretty recent. Pretty in recent. The, in the last year or so, yeah. Yeah. You, and it is you, something like, I mean, it is what you say about, you know, that these false readings can be made. Um, the problem is that really what we're doing when we talk or write about art is we're just kind of giving a readout of how it struck us at that moment. You know, it's kind of arbitrary. And it's by no means definitive. And yet there's this expectation or these, these essays are then taken as being something definitive. And, and I don't like definitive. I don't believe definitive now. I also feel lately a lot like references bother me because there's, you know, sort of also, you know, there's become this thing that like, oh, if you have these references, if you pull them out, you come from this, and now everyone can have the references either on a superficial level from just seeing images, let's say, or from a level of actually having experienced the work. And then pulling out these references doesn't make you, you know, the better writer, doesn't make you come to a conclusion. You know, these like paragraphs of references, of citations, of, I, I mean, I agree with you to some degree. It feels like there needs to be a stripping back of, um, you know, almost people wanting to hear themselves talk when yeah. they're writing about someone else's work. Yeah. Well, I think we should maybe see if other people would like to ask questions now. Hey. And Hi. Antonio, you're coming back, right? Hello. You're going to moderate this. Hello, I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, girls, for this beautiful, beautiful talk. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for taking time to read.
from the super astronaut. Sorry, I want to show the picture again because <laughs> there is um, a question about the picture um, from uh, a dear person, like a dear friend of mine, actually. <laughs> uh, she wanted to, I, I think maybe she didn't uh, catch the whole thing. So she just wanted to have some more information about where the picture comes from. Could you please tell us again? Do you want me to do it, Chris? Should I tell? Yep, that's it. Okay. Okay. So there was a series of pictures that Hervé Guibert took of his friend at the time, Isabella Jani, the actress. Um, they, they had a schism later in life and, you know, that's a longer story and actually there's a short story about it. But um, he took these portraits and I heard, I think that, you know, he was kind of frustrated by all of these, um, you know, there was, it was the 80s, I think, at the moment, and there were all of these, you can find these pictures of a Johnny with like the blue eyeshadow, you know, done up in these, these looks, and he was like, I want to take these photos of you, we're going to go to the Jardin de Plantes, you know, you have the bow in your hair, there's no makeup, you know, there's ones where she's sitting in a chair, where she's, you know, she has this big boxy kind of 80s coat on, um, and I think that was, you know, his idea was, I want to take some beautiful photos of you, my friend. And this photo um, was them, you know, walking by the tiger cage at the park. And if you look at them up online, you can see the other ones. There's like six or seven. They're really beautiful. Are they in a book or have they been shown as an exhibition? Or? You know, what's funny is they're not that commonly known. You can find them and they've been, they have been shown, but I don't think they exist in a book i mean that's an i don't think so but i'm not an i'm not an expert on him i don't know for sure but you know looking at them all together they're really incredible you know there's one of her by the plant cage where she's a little out of focus there's one of her leaning back like this you know they're just out for a day in the the jardin de plant you know a different narrative than in the book but the picture applies to the book god i would love to be out for a day in the jardin de plant with the <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Oh, actually, someone started a um, question that kind of loops into the one that I wanted to ask you. Uh, yeah, maybe I can put those two questions together. They are about the male presence in your book. Because <laughs> there are so many men in this book that kind of, I don't know, I feel like they drift in and out, you know, of the book. And after a while, they're kind of maybe interchangeable. You see what I mean? Like these characters that just like, they drop, then they come back and then they drop off again. And um, uh, yeah, I was wondering, somehow they influence the, um, the space and time of the heroines that are, um, that are in the book, but they also just don't matter. Like they both matter and don't. And it's funny because this also, sorry, I'm a bit, um, maybe it's a bit confusing, but another thing, it's, uh, it's connected. So I also read the book twice, actually, as you said before. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, you have to read it twice because the first time I read the book, like, it's so sexy. So this is something that we have, we have to say about the book. Like, it's very sexy. So first time I read the book, it made me want to cheat on my partner. You know, like, whoa, I want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like this wildness you know of like being young and like walking around the streets of Paris and everyone is super sexy and all the artists and stuff but then you get the dark side you know <laughs> like on time I read the book I was like fuck I want to crush the patriarchy you know like I want to cut dicks or something I was like, <laughs> so you know this is so interesting because yeah, you need to read it twice to understand that there is something much deeper than just like cool girls hanging out like art places and like meeting like academia, uh, uh, say like brainy, sexy guys. And I think this uh, this is something that yeah that that it's important in the um, both in the book and in what it should. Um, yeah, I mean, the question it addresses. So indeed, Lola was asking about this too. She was like, what's her question? Yeah, well, she thanks you for the beautiful conversation and then she wants you to speak, I mean, she asked if you could speak about the different dynamics between the male and female characters that throughout the book and this tension that plays out, you know, between um, expectation, desire and reality. One thing that comes to mind, but I want, I'd like to hear what Chris has to say about this, but one thing that comes to mind for me is that like, 
in how many stories are the women what the men are in this story? They just float in and out and they're interchangeable and they're the, like the one, you know, there's this category of woman, this category of woman. And then, I mean, right? Isn't there, isn't there a contrast there in how many stories in which these male protagonists are living, you know, their, their dreams while the women just kind of act as, but I'd love to hear what Chris has to say about yeah, that. No, I mean, I think the female friendship um, in Super Rationals is the heart of the book. Um, Mathilde's actual partner, Jack, is largely off stage, and her interactions with the other men in the book are, you know, mostly social and professional, but it's her relationship with Gretchen, really, and her also relationship with her missing mother that jives everything. So I don't know if that means that you're making the man purposefully absent or absent to make a point, but they're just not as important to the story as the two women. Yeah, I just think, I mean, I don't think I've done like a great job of it here, but I'm always trying to figure out female friendship because I think it's super complicated. And I think it's, um, you know, it's something that doesn't get easier, actually the opposite maybe as we get older. And it just felt like something I wanted to just look into through a story, you know, without a conclusion. And I guess that's kind of, you know, what happens with them. And I think a lot of people can have had similar experiences, you know, and I don't know, to me, that was what seemed like the focus. Of course, we also interact often with our female friends in order to deal with our romantic relationships, which is very much a theme in the book as well how that all plays out together. Right. Um, there is another question from Ira. Uh, she asks about Matilda. So she says, is Matilda the character inspired by a real person or did she just come, oh, what? oh, or did she just come to you? Like, did she just appear or is she inspired a very real person? I mean, they're all, they're all fictional characters. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of people have actually written me and been like, is this me? I'm like, <laughs> is this me? And I'm like, no, but it's funny. And it also, to me, that was an important part of the book as well, is that we read to recognize, you know, and maybe anyone would think, is this me? If they, if they knew I had had an encounter with them, you know, it's like an important part of the reader writer relationship. I think this sort of um, recognition of, oh, you know, that happened to me, I'm not alone. <laughs> but also the sense that like, oh, is this character, you know what I mean? And it's just, then it becomes so human. It becomes, it could be you, it could be him, it could be, mm -hmm. but no, no one's anyone in particular. But there are so many vices anyways, I feel like. And uh, one vice that I was wondering about, that's actually the vice of academia, which has been a big fascination for me for years, you know, like studying art history and like, wanted to be an artist, but at the same time wanting to write about art. So I was wondering actually about, so the book is divided into many, um, yeah, I mean, there are many voices speaking throughout the book and- um, I thought you were saying vices at first and I was like, I like that. There are many vices and many voices. <laughs> <laughs> they go together, for sure they go together. And yeah, so what about, you know, there is this kind of, I feel this fascination for academia, something like academia being, I don't know, like the new cool for girls who just work in uh, the art world. And then, so about the, um, the um, how do you call it? Like, yeah, the critical, so at some point in the book, there is this uh, disclaimer, all art criticism throughout this book is strictly under copyright of Mathilde de saint a so, Very lovely way to start this, um, how do you say interspersed sections where you, you or her, I mean, where the, the character is uh, writing about art. So is this in any way uh, a cut up um, process? Are I mean, it's meant somewhere? to be, it's meant to be kind, I mean, there's a lot of making fun of the Courtauld French, the Courtauld for instance, or like going to school for art history or, you know, I mean, or this idea that people claim, you know, superiority because they got their degree from X, Y, Z and went through. I mean, there's a lot of uh, cynicism about that, I guess, and making fun of that and making fun of the notion that that somehow legitimizes you or, 
I mean, there's a reverence for it as well. And the art criticism in the book that's written by Mathilde, which is written by me, is not very good. But um, I guess if that's what you mean, like, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of mockery surrounding it. And, you know, the frustration of, um, but also the realization of, you know, the trappings of academia and what that means. And I don't know, Chris, what do you think about that? Well, I don't know what part of the question did you want me to speak to? I mean, do you think, how do you think the book um, is confronting or, you know, dealing with ideas of like academia as a pursuit or? No, um, I think that, I don't think it's a parody of academic writing, if that's what you mean. I think it's very heartfelt and sincere. And the writer of those texts, she may not, you know, may not always agree with her, it may not be right, but she's trying to understand certain things through her viewings of these artworks. Which I find it very first degree. I love that. Okay. I love that way of explaining it. Yeah, that it is one per it's like anybody could say that or do their own version of that towards an artwork. It's her being the critic, filling the void. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Is that okay? I was like, <laughs> again. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Well, thank you, girls. This is really. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it was really great well, time to have you here. And um, yeah, I guess we can, unless there is another question. No, I think we're fine. Well, yeah, I also need to run because the curfew is coming up in Paris. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, so Antonia. Thank so you so very much. much. And Antonia, thank you so much. I really hope we can see each other in person soon again. Yes. <laughs> uh, please just buy this okay. book. Right? That's what we are here for. Celebrate Bye. it. <laughs> beautiful work. Okay. Bye, everyone. Talk soon. Bye. See you guys thank later. You. Thank you. Thank you.